to make an announcement, and that is that uh, there's going to be a special issue of catalysis today uh, from this uh, symposium called Syngas Creation and its Use. And uh, the organizers, Bertrand Davis and the undersigned, would like to have your contributions before uh, or in the beginning of June at the latest. Thank you very much. In session, and the first talk will be given uh, on uh, nickel oxide based uh, oxygen transfer, OGM materials, right? And uh, please. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like first to thank the organizers for inviting us to participate in this uh, honorary event for Gas Austria Commission whose uh, contributions to science and technology inspired all of us for many years, working with uh, production of energy. This is a work in collaboration of the Aristotle University in Greece and uh, the Texas a and University of Canada. <coughs> this is the outline of my presentation. I will start with a brief introduction, actually introducing a new concept, the concept of Social enhanced combined with chemical looping method and forming. I will continue with the thermodynamic analysis of this complex concept. Then I will switch to the experimental work and present the development we have done on oxygen transfer materials based on nickel. Then I will talk about preliminary testing together of the oxygen transfer materials and CO2 solvents in the short-term enhanced chemical looping reforming, and I will end my presentation for the conclusions. I will skip this slide because everybody knows the importance of hydrogen production. And nowadays, the, the process which is mainly used for the production of hydrogen from methane is the conventional steam methane reforming which is a process, a high intensive process, multi-step process, because we need to purify hydrogen, and this costs high, this has high cost. Recently, an effort has been directed towards finding alternative processes which can produce hydrogen in one step, in a single step. And this process, the solution enhanced steam method reforming, has the advantage that it produces hydrogen and purifies hydrogen because in the reformer there is calcium oxide or a material which has, uh, which can solve, remove continuously the carbon dioxide. So we can have hydrogen coming off the reformer at very high purity, over 90%. The problem with this process is that we need to regenerate the calcium carbonate, and for this we need energy. While the, the carbonation of calcium oxide in the reformer provides the necessary energy, so this reformer operates almost automatically, we need the energy for this step. <coughs> so, going one step further, one might ask, how, how could I get some energy in situ for this reactor, for the regeneration reactor. And the answer is by having combination between the sorption enhanced and the chemical looping reform. By this concept, we can have nearly autothermal operation, both in the reformer and in the regenerator. How? By having inside the reformer an oxygen transfer material. Reducing this material and then by oxidizing this nickel, in our case, nickel oxide, we could provide directly the energy we need to reactivate the solvent. Let's have a closer look to the main reactions which take place in these um, reactors. The reforming reactor, we have first the steam reform reaction, the water receive. This sum up, these two reactions sum up with this one. And if we have calcium oxide in the reformer, then we can continuously remove CO2. By removing CO2, we shift the equilibrium to the right, so we can increase the purity of hydrogen, and of course, we can increase 
the conversion of men. This reaction is highly exothermic and it comes very nicely with the exothermic stimuli form. By having combination of chemical loading, this means that <coughs> we will add into the former nickel oxide. Part of methane will react with nickel oxide, will reduce nickel oxide, so nickel actually will serve then as a catalyst for the reforming. Methane will, can react with nickel oxide to produce also CO and these two can also reduce some of nickel oxide. So this is the, these are the main reactions that take place in the reforming reactor. While in the regeneration reactor, we will have the, the solvent regeneration, which means a calcination reaction, calcination reaction by which calcium carbonate is converted to calcium oxide and CO2. And of course, the reaction which provides the necessary energy for this calcination reaction is nickel dioxide. So nickel plus oxygen give us nickel oxide. Since all these reactions are reactions which are uh, affected by equilibrium, our first step in our research was to perform a dynamic analysis and define the optimum operating conditions and the energy balance. So for this we investigated several scenarios like the conventional stimulant material forming, the simple sorption enhanced reforming with calcium oxide based sorbent, and the sorption enhanced chemical loading together with uh, sorption enhanced together with chemical loading using nickel oxide as an oxygen transfer material. We investigate the effect of several parameters like temperature, pressure, steam to carbon, calcium oxide to nickel oxide ratio, calcium oxide to methane ratio for the reforming and the reoxidation uh, steps. We used actually, we did all the calculations by using the uh, software uh, by Aspen Plus 20. And of course, we developed uh, the necessary flow diagrams uh, in quite a large detail in order to get reliable uh, energy balances. I'm not going to explain everything, uh, all the results we got from this and the dynamic analysis. I would like just to show you what is the effect of the most important parameters, like the effect of ratio of calcium oxide to methane ratio. With, in these graphs, I'm presenting the performer performance, in other words, the uh, methane conversion, the CO2 capsule, hydrogen yield, and hydrogen purity as a function of calcium to methane ratio. With the, the red uh, symbols, uh, we represent the data for the uh, combined sorption enhanced chemical looping with the black symbols, the sorption enhanced. As expected, by increasing the calcium oxide ratio, we increase the CO2 capture and hydrogen fluid. At, at values higher than 0 0.8, we don't see any further effect, and this is due actually to the thermodynamic equilibrium of calcium carbonate to calcium oxide. Keep in mind that this data were taken at 650 degrees centigrade, and this is the temperature, the maximum temperature in which we can get advantage of using the calcium oxide in the report. If we have higher temperature, then the equilibrium of calcium oxide and calcium carbonate is in this um, sun. So we need to operate at lower temperatures. As we see here, hydrogen yield increases with the increase of calcium oxide to methane ratio. Mostly for the sorption enhanced reforming, we have a loss in hydrogen yield in the case we have the combination of chemical loading and um, sorption enhanced. By this data, we can uh, define the optimum operating window for the ratio between calcium oxide and methane. We should work in the area between 0 0.8 and 1. If we see the heat duty as expected, the more calcium oxide we add to the reformer, the less, the lower is the heat duty in the reformer. And we can achieve 80% lower heat demand when we use the ratio of calcium oxide to methane 0 0.8. And this for 650 degrees centigrade. We didn't observe any differences and practically the presence of nickel oxide in the reformer does not affect the heat duty. 
However, when our heat balance includes also the regenerator, then we see that the picture changes. And the, we can see that in the case of structural enhancement, we have a decrease in the heat duty, but not that much. When we uh, combine it with the presence of nickel oxide, at the ratio of nickel oxide to calcium oxide 0 0.5, then we can achieve 26 less heat. We, we can have a conservation of about 26% in uh, the heat demand in the system of the upper and uh, reformer and regenerator. And this is due to the oxidation of metallic nickel oxide. What about the effect of nickel oxide to calcium oxide? If we see this graph, then we can see that hydrogen purity slightly increases or very little increase in hydrogen over 92, 92 to uh, almost 70% when nickel oxide to calcium oxide ratio is 1 to 1. So in order to compensate for the loss in hydrogen yield, we need to operate at a window of 0.5 to 0.7. Let's now compare the three processes. And in order to have meaningful com comparison between the, two pro the three processes, we need to compare the processes under optimized conditions for each process and assume, of course, similar product quality. This means that the, the comparison was made for uh, steel metal forming at 850, operating at 850 and 25 atmospheres, still to carbon free. For the solution enhanced reforming, 650 temperature in the reformer, 850 in the regenerator, similar temperatures in the uh, combined solution enhanced moving. <coughs> and we had to add some more additional steps. We added the compression of hydrogen at 25 atmospheres, also for these two processes in order to have similar quality of hydrogen, and we need to have hydrogen at high pressure. And we had to add for the steam reforming process, the rectal process, in order to capture CO2 and increase the purity of hydrogen. By this, we can see that the hydrogen heat, which is achieved, varies between 80 <coughs> and 90%, with the steam reforming showing the lowest hydrogen heat, and the suction enhanced the highest. Going to hydrogen surety, by introducing the requisite process, we were able to increase the, the hydrogen surety to 94% in the similar rate that the hydrogen surety, which, is, uh, um, which we produce, we can achieve from the suction enhanced and the normal process of suction enhanced and chemical loop. What about the thermal loop? The thermal demands for the steel metal forming <coughs> amount to 100 megajoules per kilomole of hydrogen. Why, by having this concept, this novel concept, we can decrease actually the energy demands by 55% than the conventional process for the same hydrogen quality. Pressure of 35 bars and purity almost 94%. But all these are theoretical data and we wanted to know how the system, this concept, behaves in reality. So for this, the key point is to develop materials. Materials as oxygen transfer and materials as CO2 solvents. <coughs> and that these materials should to fulfill several requirements. They have to show high capacity, the materials for CO2 absorption, CO2 absorption capacity and high oxygen transfer um, capacity. They have to be hydrothermally stable. They, they should show uh, fast kinetics compatible with that of reforming. And for, especially for the oxygen transfer material, the materials should exhibit actually high catalytic activity because the oxygen transfer material will serve also as catalyst for the steam metal form. We selected nickel oxide as the oxygen transfer material, and the reason is that nickel oxide has high capacity in oxygen transfer, which is the highest among all the oxygen transfer materials which are known from the literature for the chemical looping. 
and these are either iron or copper or manganese oxide. The nickel oxide shows the highest oxygen transfer capacity, and it has very high catalytic activity in the form. I'm not going to present you the work we have done for the development of calcium uh, oxide uh, CO2 solvents. I will stick only to the development of oxygen transfer materials. Our partners in Qatar synthesized four different oxygen transfer materials containing 48% of nickel oxide on supports like alumina, silica, titanium, and zirconia. We measured the BD surface area and we found that depend, this depends, of course, on the uh, support use. The higher is the support surface area, the higher is the oxygen transfer material surface area. We characterized the, these materials by X ray diffraction and we found, as expected, due to the very high loading in nickel oxide, that the main uh, crystal phase is, is this of nickel oxide. For the nickel on silica and nickel on zirconia, we didn't observe any uh, interaction between the support and nickel. However, we did observe nickel <coughs> in, uh, in this uh, sample, 40% so nickel on the titanium, and also nickel aluminate in the sample which was prepared, which uh, was supported on aluminum. By using this data, we calculated the nickel oxide crystallite size and we found that, of course, due to the very high loading, the crystallites are uh, big enough and the, the size of the crystallites depend also on the surface area of the support. The, uh, the crystallite size varies between 30 and uh, 60 nanometers. As these are considered as reducible oxide, we would like to know about the reducibility of uh, the four materials. And for this, we perform um, hydrogen PPR. Uh, you see here the profiles we go, and there are for which we can uh, see similarities and differences. Uh, but uh, in, uh, what is in common for the four materials is that all OTMs exhibited uh, peaks between the reduction peaks between 300 and 500. For the case of nickel and titanium, we observe a, a peak at higher temperature, and this is due to the reduction of the nickel titanate, while in the nickel and alumina, we observe this high temperature peak, which was ascribed to the reduction of uh, nickel alumina. So once we had uh, characterized our materials, we uh, test the, tested the materials in the flow unit, uh, as, first of all, to check about the pure reforming activity, as happens. So we pre-reduced the material at 650 degrees centigrade, and then we started the reaction by adding uh, a feed of uh, methane and steam at the ratio of 3, reaction temperature 650, for very high space velocity. Here you see the results we got, methane conversion as a function of time, Two of uh, the four materials behave quite su satisfactory. The nickel and alumina, very high uh, conversion. <coughs> nickel and zirconia, high conversion. And the deactivation was lower than 10% after 10 hours of testing. However, nickel and silica and nickel titanium, they were disappointed. In order to check if the reason for such a high deactivation was a very uh, high gas out phase velocity, we perform another series of tests with these two materials at lower gas average space velocity and again the same picture, the same uh, very fast deactivation and low methane conversion was obtained for nickel or silicon and nickel or titanium. So we then wanted to know what was the reason that these two materials did not give us uh, high methane conversion and deactivating so fast. So the first question is, is there any carbon on these materials? So to answer this question, we did a temperature program of station. And here you see the profiles of CO2 for the, the four materials. As expected, the profiles are different, both qualitatively, different types of coke, or silica and titanium, while hop over nickel and zirconia 
oxidizes the higher temperature. When we measure calculated the amount of carbon, we found that it's very, very low. And since the duration of each test was different, then we calculated again the rate of carbon production uh, based on uh, <coughs> organized or calculated as mole of solid carbon for the mole of methane that was admitted in the reactor. Again, the two very bad materials, very bad catalysts, show high rate of solid carbon formation, but again this rate is very, very low. So carbon is not the reason. We measured the crystallized size of the used catalyst for silica and titania. We found that there is some synthery. The crystallize become bigger, but again, the, this increase cannot explain the very low, the very high degree of deactivation. We did XTS analysis for the nickel of titania, and we found that indeed, if the used catalyst, the intensity of the thick which corresponds to metallic nickel, lowers very much. So actually, in the presence of titania, this oxygen transfer material, this catalyst, nickel is oxidized by steam at the, at the relatively low temperature of recording. The case for our best catalyst, best oxygen transfer material, is different. This is a stable material, and for this we found that in the used catalyst, actually, the amount of metallic nickel is very high. So zirconia can stabilize nickel in a reduced form, even in the presence of steam at 650 degrees centigrade, centigrade, while titania does not. So this was probably the reason. For silica, we haven't done yet the XPS analysis, but silica, we know that in the presence of steel, is not stable, so it was rather expected that nickel or silica will not be the best catalyst. So our next step was to check the materials as chemical lubricants, as <coughs> transfer material. And for this, we selected only the promising uh, materials, the nickel and aluminum and nickel and zirconia, and we introduced them in the reactor without any pre-reduction, in oxidic form. We did the test for one hour under reforming condition and then we switched and increased the temperature at 850 and we uh, oxidized the material. Let's see how the reforming proceeds. We have a, a, an oxygen transfer material which is in oxidized form and it seems that very, very easily and very fast nickel oxide is reduced by methane and then the catalyst which is formed drives all the reforming reactions. The methane conversion is high in the presence of nickel and aluminum. The methane conversion is very high in the presence of nickel and zirconia. So both materials are active when used as in oxidic form. Of interest to see that in the oxidation part, in the oxidation step, we didn't see any CO2, any carbon dioxide, which means that there is not any coke formed during the reforming period. Here you see the 20 cycles for this uh, chemical looking reforming and oxidation activity of nickel on zirconia. By these blue uh, dots, we present the hydrogen concentration. This is the reformed gas concentration. The, this black Black data are the uh, methane concentration. As you see, we have almost constant gas composition during the cycling of reforming and the oxidation. Total duration uh, 20 hours. And uh, we observe a uh, deactivation degree of almost only 2%. The lower deactivation degree compared to the pure steam reforming might be ascribed to the oxidative treatment at 850, which may regenerate the catalyst and keep it, uh, keeping the active metal area constant. With aluminum, we did the same, and here I'm presenting the results as methane conversion as a function of cycling. However, compared to zirconia, alumina didn't show a satisfactory performance, and the 
the most probable reason for the instability of alumina, of nickel of alumina, under this uh, cycle is the, the lower hydrothermal stability of uh, this support. Now, let's see some very recent results in which we combine actually this oxygen transfer material, the nickel of zirconia, which showed very promising performance, with the CO2 sorbent. And the CO2 sorbent is a sorbent which is uh, a mixture between calcium oxide and zirconia. Actually, actually, we had done a lot of work with uh, this uh, sorbent and we found that this sorbent, which by chance contains zirconia also, uh, shows a stability for over 100 cycles as a solvent uh, of CO2. So we tested, we mixed these two materials at a ratio, molar ratio, 0.5 to 1, and we tested under reduction in forming carbonation conditions at 650 degrees centigrade for steel to carbon ratio 4. And then for the oxidation at 800 in air flow at, um, for 10 degrees. Here we see the result we got. In this graph, I'm presenting the hydrogen concentration at the reactor exit as a function of time. For this period, for almost 15 minutes, the mixture of the sorbent and the oxygen transfer material worked perfectly. Why? Because we saw very quickly the production of hydrogen. The methane concentration shown in this axis is very low, almost complete methane conversion. And the CO2 sorbent captures continuously the CO2, which uh, has a very low concentration, and the CO concentration is very low. So we produce a, mix, a, a pure, not 100%, 95% hydrogen is produced for 15 minutes. Once the sorbent starts saturating, then after 15 minutes, then we go to the breakthrough period where we show the increase in methane concentration, lowering of the conversion, and the increase of the CO and CO2. After almost 70 minutes, then the system behaves like in steam reforming, in a uh, conventional steam reforming, the hydrogen purity decreases and the CO and CO2 uh, concentration increases. So we, indeed, the sorbent and the oxygen transfer material work together producing hydrogen. But what about the oxidation step? Once we finish with this step, then at 650 degrees centigrade after helium purging, we started the flow of air. And then what we saw very soon after the air ignition, we observed that the temperature increased. It, uh, it was around all, over 80, uh, 800 degrees centigrade. And at the same time, in the CO2 analyzer, we saw the CO2 coming off the calcium carbonate. And at at this point, we started the external heat. So by some simple calculations, we were able to, to see that actually the preheating thermal demands and more than 35% of the heat duty of the solar generations are covered by the highly exothermic nickel dioxide. So in this step, in this area here, we have the oxidation of nickel to nickel oxide, the production of heat, which heat is uh, used for the increase of temperature and the uh, calcination of calcium carbonate and calcium oxide. So indeed, the concept can be applied in practice. Of course, we need to optimize the condition, we need to do more work, and we need to do a lot of science. So coming to the conclusions, the concept of combined chemical looping and uh, sorption enhanced steam methane forming for the production of pure hydrogen in one step with minimum heat demands was investigated theoretically and proved experimentally. 55 lower energy demands, 55% lower energy demands 
than the conventional process for the same hydrogen quality. The oxygen transfer material which we uh, <coughs> developed, two of them showed very promising performance, and especially the nickel or zirconia, almost a negligible uh, deactivation, high activity in chemical looping reforming, while the combination of two materials, one oxygen transfer and one sorbent, based on calcium oxide and based on nickel, the oxygen transfer, showed potential for this novel concept. Production of hydrogen with over 95% purity and covering a lot of uh, the energy heat, the, the heat which is needed for the calcination, for the decomposition of calcium carbonate by the oxidation of nickel to nickel oxide. I'd like to thank the Qatar uh, National Research Fund and the program NPRP for funding this research and you for your attention. Thank you. Yes, yes. Um, that's an interesting concept, and for sure, uh, your thermodynamic analysis uh, uh, demonstrates uh, all this, and uh, people have worked on this, so uh, it's interesting uh, whether one can find it, uh, a solution. Also, the scheme has the advantage that you create a concentrated CO2 stream, so if you, have, uh, if you talk about uh, CO2 sequestration, these kind of systems have a special interest. However, uh, when you compare with uh, a steam reforming technology, you should compare with a modern hydrogen plant. I'm aware of companies who can guarantee uh, the energy consumption 6 to 10 percent higher than the theoretical minimum. These uh, are using low steam to carbon ratio and pressure swing adsorption. So go into the literature and see the real figures uh, because uh, a lot of things have happened since man, uh, one made uh, hydrogen plants with high steam to carbon ratios and CO2 wash systems. Second thing, people who have worked with fluidized bed uh, and reforming have had big problems uh, uh, because the CO will react with the hydrogen on catalyst dust in downstream equipment. It has, in fact, destroyed some developments. I know Exxon, no, Mobile worked on that. So you should be very much aware that you have no dust leaving your reactor and you have CO, small amounts of CO leaving, and that will be uh, lost uh, by methanation. Third question. <laughs> you have hot air leaving your calcination step. How do you recover the heat of the hot air leaving your calcination step? How, uh, could you uh, repeat? You, you, you have air, you, you mean the calcination step. You have very hot air there, right? <coughs> How do you recover the heat from that? I don't, I don't remember. Uh, I don't remember the exact uh, flow diagram in our thermodynamic analysis, but we have done this. But, uh, but, uh, <laughs> the heat balance is on the solids. Uh, a gas reaction, but you have a big air stream coming through your calcinator, mm -hmm. and that air will leave at high temperatures. And uh, so my question is, how do you recover that heat? You can't give it to the birds. Of course, <laughs> of course, we, we can we can uh, produce some uh, steam. But uh, how do you calculate the steam in your energy balance? Uh, hydrogen plants would be neutral in steam. You can't uh, make a hydrogen plant as a steam generator. So I'm just saying this. Uh, to warn you when you make these calculations. Okay. Uh, and uh, so it's said in a good will because a general steam where you have uh, the combination of the CO2 absorption of calcium oxide mm -hmm. uh, coupled with the steam reforming uh, is extremely interesting. But it's just your comparison with the present technology is, is not. Uh, so you think that the advantage is much. Uh, yeah. Nobody, yes. nobody's using reactor shows in hydrogen plants. Oh, that's uh, 20 years. But, I, but I think we have to stop no, now. No, because reason, excuse me. The reason we used a reactor show it was was that it was uh, almost ready from the asphalt. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, okay. I understand. But I'm just yeah. saying nobody okay. is using it in practice today. Okay. And I'm afraid we have to move on to the next one because we have exceeded our time a little bit. Okay. So I'm sorry you have to, to discuss. But before you leave, uh, <coughs> I would like to make an important announcement. And that is, we have persuaded the guest of honor here to give two talks tomorrow. One is titled uh, 50 Years in Catalysis, and the other one is uh, even more interesting, I think, Lesson Learned. <laughs>